Good morning, folks. I'm up early again this morning. It's about an hour before sunrise. Here in southern Arizona. I'm drinking Peruvian chancha mayo fresh ground coffee beans out of my uh, Navajo coffee cup made by a guy named Mike who was a Navajo Indian. I've had this cup for so long I don't even remember where or when I got it but it had to be it had to be 30 years ago or thereabouts long time ago it's got a lot of cracks in it actually but the cracks have sort of sealed themselves up with coffee grounds over time so it doesn't really leak at all <laughs> the purpose of this video <clears throat> is primarily to showcase this violin here This violin was made by a feller named um, Thomas, excuse me, that's early yet, Thomas Goring, G-O-E-R-I-N-G, -E Goring, Thomas Goring, who was uh, originally from Topeka, Kansas. Let's take the shoulder rest off here. This violin is dated 1987 and is numbered number six. I just recently acquired this violin. I haven't even owned it a week. American or North American Big Leaf Maple. There's a couple of little black lines on the back of the neck. Uh, we call that spalting. When we see these uh, little black lines that occur in the wood. Um, American or North American Big Leaf Maple was, uh, uh, it was not uncommon. It is not uncommon to find spalting lines in North American big leaf maple, which comes either from the Pacific Northwest of America or perhaps into Western Canada, as far as I know. Got a little bit of a slant to the curl and the ribstock on both sides, which is kind of cool. Very competent violin making. Very, very, very competent. So I did a little research on this feller before I purchased this violin. And there's a whole other story which I'm about to tell you about the purchase of this violin. Uh, the only thing I've managed to do to it since I actually uh, obtained it was to give it a very light cleaning, basically just a wipe down, and uh, throw a better bridge on it. The bridge that was on there was completely unacceptable and quite frankly uh, bordering, on, bordering on stupid. So I just found a used bridge and uh, reconfigured it just a little bit, did a very quick job of putting a, uh, a bridge on the instrument that would uh, enable it to be played so I could get some clue as to what it sounded like. Still got the same sound post inside that it had when it uh, came to me. Um, very nice arching. Very fine indeed. Like the little scoops down here of the wings. 
The color of the varnish is uh, just a wee bit slightly unusual. Uh, must have been something pertaining to whatever preparation uh, he used uh, back in the day, back in the uh, 1980s. It's a little bit chippy. It will chip off in flakes here and there. Um, although it has a pretty darn nice texture. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the jury is still out as to whether it's a speared varnish or whether it's an oil bar, oil based varnish. I think it's actually an oil based varnish to be honest with you, which uh, he used a fair amount of drying agent in the uh, final mixture, which gave it a little bit of a a uh, little bit of chippiness because it also has a uh, there is some evidence of some crack allure in the varnish in a couple of spots, which indicates it had some, uh, perhaps just a smidgen too much drying uh, agent, such as alcohol, and turpentine. But overall, it's a very fine uh, attempt at violin, make, violin making indeed, very fine, in my humble opinion. And it's got a tone to match. I was quite surprised when I first laid a bow on it. So, uh, it's quite a nice little box, I must say. So, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, story pertaining to its acquisition. <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous, actually. Folks, if you're ever going to buy anything on eBay, one does so uh, knowing that you are assuming some risk. Especially, especially if you get up into some money, you're assuming a big risk. Um, when I, I like to surf on eBay uh, through uh, uh, the violins. I usually use old violin as a heading. Because that narrows it down to, uh, I mean, that carves out a lot of the new crap, um, of which there are literally thousands upon thousands of new uh, student violins coming in from China and elsewhere. Uh, so, I narrow my uh, search field, usually to old violins or French violins or older German violins, uh, Bohemian violins, American violins. Whatever, you know. Anyway, imagine my surprise when the, this violin pops up. Violin by Thomas Goring, 1987. And I must say that the photographs provided only amounted to four total photographs rather than the uh, standard eight. And the photographs were just as, uh, just as shitty and low grade as anything you could ever possibly hope for. If that's what you're looking for. Very grainy, out of focus. Um, <clears throat> how, however, there was enough, just enough detail that I could glean from the photos to, to see that it was indeed a handmade violin. 
and then had some interesting uh, characteristics which indicated it was indeed handmade and not just some not just some uh, you know uh, import you know modern import of some sort the color of the varnish would kind of also help to give it away as being not from China or uh, Eastern Europe or Germany <clears throat> um, the, the color of the varnish is just unusual enough to where uh, uh, it really did appear to be a handmade violin by somebody whether or not it was made by a fellow named Thomas Goring or not remained to be seen so anyway I uh, made an offer on it which was less than the asking price and uh, the, the feller who turns out to have been in LA accepted my offer so uh, I paid for it with PayPal and I waited for the dang thing to show up several days later a box appears uh, at my front door and I uh, pulled it out um, pulled the violin out of the case and um, it was just a cheap ass glossy Chinese violin brand spanking new not a scratch on it absolutely brand spanking new violin probably from Beijing very pretty woods pretty curly maple on the sides and the back very glossy finish a little bit uh, grotesque actually the glossiness of it but finely made instrument a finely made student uh, instrument from China which uh, we often see uh, retailing for oh man they could retail anywhere from three or four hundred bucks depending upon the shop uh, on up to a couple of thousand it all depends um, so needless to say when I pulled that Chinese fiddle out of that case and realized it was not the violin that I had purchased I was fucking pissed off pissed off there were expletives flying out of my mouth in little clouds in every direction uh, I immediately messaged the seller uh, and I was uh, shall we say pretty blunt about it and I said what the fuck are you trying to pull on me here uh, you know I'm a I'm an old uh, customer of eBay I've made many 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 hundreds of purchases off of eBay and uh, never have I been scammed like this before uh, you better make this right uh, uh, somehow but uh, what I'm going to do sir is immediately put in for a refund and I'm going to report you to the uh, to uh, eBay as being a uh, you know a, a fraud oh he messaged me back oh no 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 uh, uh, oh, so very sorry so very very sorry uh, you need you have to trust me that was a mistake uh, I shipped two violins out that day um, and so yeah, I, I must have somehow interchanged the vi the two violins and one customer uh, got the wrong one and then you got the wrong one uh, the other customer uh, who apparently apparently was supposed to have received the uh, Chinese violin well, lived up in uh, Washington State of course the Thomas Goring violin was intended for me out here in Arizona so you got them switched like complete dumbass that he apparently is who the hell switches violins when you're shipping how the hell do you make a mistake like that god damn it's beyond my comprehension in any case um, <laughs> um, his uh, repeated apologies led me to believe that well perhaps just perhaps he had uh, truly made a, a mistake uh, so I put in for a refund and uh, it was amazing how fast the refund actually came back to me from PayPal by uh, by eBay through PayPal or whatever and the money showed up back in my bank account so I was happy uh, and I, uh, that took the pressure off of me even though the cost of this violin was, was remarkably low actually um, if it was a truly uh, legitimate Thomas Goring violin I would have thought that a seller would 
have sold it, have sold it for quite a bit more. But who knows what goes on on eBay? Maybe it's maybe the violin is stolen. Uh, <laughs> who knows how the guy might have uh, obtained a Thomas Goring violin somewhere down in the bowels of Los Angeles? <laughs> God only knows. If violins could only talk. So <clears throat> he continued to insist that. Uh, that it was an honest mistake, and he was trying to figure out a way he could just have the other guy ship the Goring violin directly to me. But he wanted me to. Uh, he said he would repost the violin on eBay, and then, and uh, could I just repurchase it, and then we could start over again, since I had already gotten my refund. Of course, uh, uh, alarm bells and red flags were going up all over the place when he asked me to consider repurchasing it. However. After repeated messaging back and forth, there must have been a, at least 10 messages that went back and forth trying to figure out how to arrange this transaction. <clears throat> uh, he, <laughs> he, uh, whoops. Uh, I decided to purchase it a second time. And, um, and then pay for it with a credit card. So, I would be doubly protected rather than having the funds drawn directly out of my bank account. I decided to pay for it with a credit card. So if I was scammed a second time, I could just put in for, I could just claim fraud with my bank and they would immediately remove the charges from my account. So that's what I did. I decided to give the guy a benefit of the doubt, especially after all of his <clears throat> apologies and explanations. Um, whether that makes me gullible, somehow, I don't know, but, um, <clears throat> I've been doing this kind of stuff for long enough to uh, know how to spot, um, clues for, uh, fraud and for, for scams, but sometimes you just have to, you just look at all the evidence in front of you and try to figure out what to do. Bottom line, I really wanted to get my hands on this Thomas Goring violin, if that's indeed what it really truly was. Why? Because I did a little research before I bought it the first time, and I discovered that Thomas Goring uh, began to make violins in the early 1980s. This violin here was probably one of the last violins that he made all on his own. And from the evidence I've been able to gather, it was probably made up in Missoula, Montana, even though he was, a fr he was originally from Topeka, Kansas. But he, was, he had gained uh, considerable skills as a repair person and maker, and so was moving around the country uh, amongst uh, several shops, uh, for gainful employment purposes, shall we say, and uh, he, uh, uh, but as it turns out, in the late 1980s, he abandoned violin making because he realized that what he really truly was interested in mostly was bow making, and so he, he embarked upon uh, 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 obtaining a training uh, under the tutelage of several very important bow makers, including Will, William Salco in New York, um, Jerry Paskowitz. I think he studied under uh, David Samuels, extremely famous, internationally famous bow maker. Uh, so he did some apprenticeships and. Uh, 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 sought out training under these various uh, bow makers, and um, in uh, a relatively short period of time, maybe inside of uh, uh, three or four years, he had honed his bow making skills up to an extremely high degree. And uh, he has since gone on to be a, a quite an esteemed bow maker, and he's. Uh, his bows are uh, absolutely world-class, world-class. 
all the violin family, uh, violin, viola, cello, and bass bows. Although I think he concentrates mostly on a violin, viola, and cello, like a lot of makers do. But um, superb bows. I wish I could get my hands on one, quite frankly. As it turns out, uh, some years back, quite a few years back, uh, Thomas Gordon moved back to his hometown of Topeka, Kansas, and that's where he uh, owns and operates and works out of his own shop there, making bows. So now you can see uh, of why I wanted to get, get my hands on this Thomas Goring violin. At the time he made the violin, he was not famous. He was just another guy who was learning violin making and making some pretty decent instruments. And uh, um, But the fact that he uh, went on to uh, acclaim and fame as a bow maker just uh, lends a uh, substance to my reasons for wanting th this violin, if you uh, catch my meaning there. So, I bought the violin a second time on eBay after trusting the doofus in LA who made the mistake the first time. <coughs> Imagine my surprise when the second uh, box showed up about four or five days later, and um, it was a Thomas Goring violin, made in 1987, number six, right from the workbench of Thomas Goring. It does not indicate what town he was in on the label. But like I said before, I believe uh, there is a likelihood that he was uh, making fiddles up in uh, Missoula, Montana, in addition to doing restoration and repair work there. I believe it was at the shop of a guy named Mark Hollinger, who was himself a fine maker. Um, the fact that he was in Missoula, Montana might help to explain the fact that he used a uh, North American Big Leaf Maple as a choice for his sides, back, and neck, since that kind of wood is uh, from the general region up there, probably abundant, uh, abundantly available from uh, wood sellers up in that region, if you know what I mean. So that's the story. <laughs> that's the story of the Thomas Goring violin. <laughs> Swear to God, folks, whenever you get into something uh, on eBay, you assume some risk. Yes, I have been ripped off several times on eBay. Hence my concern about this particular transaction. However, all's well that ends well, and uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, have obtained this violin. care for these strings on here. I don't care for the sound post. The pegs are going to have to be changed. They don't fit all that great actually. The violin's going to need cleaning, touch-up, and uh, a better tailpiece, and so forth and so on. And I can't hardly wait to uh, embark upon uh, all of those various things. Thomas Goring. Internationally famous bow maker. Thomas Goring Violin, 1987. Number six. From uh, my research, he may have only made one or two more violins after this. If, if, if even that, before he uh, 
who dove headlong into bow making. Alright folks, enough said. That's enough of the show and tell for today. Remember back in grade school, we'd pick a certain day. I think it, it used to be on a Friday because everybody was excited about the, the coming weekend when they could be off school. Uh, so that's kind of why we would do show and tell on a Friday. And of course, uh, y'all perhaps remember show and tell from grade school back in at least when I was younger you would bring something to school and just uh you know write up a little report about it read it to the class with whatever object it was <laughs> those are those were really fun little things to do and um I guess really that's basically all I have done this morning is here is to have a little show and tell a little expose uh, to showcase this Thomas Goring violin, which I think is very, very cool. And I'm just thrilled that I was finally able to uh, get my hands on it. So having said that, I'm done. Let's see. Alrighty. Signing off.